I'm, I'm going to do first a summary of the kind of things that we do in the group. And as the title, say, title says, right, so I'm going to be discussing uh, extreme environments, materials under extreme environments. Uh, the application for that are um, explosives in general, right? And how these materials react to interactions with shocks. So this is, uh, these pictures are very old. These four are gone, okay? So these four still <laughs> They left, they finished, uh, they all, see, you see she was graduating, and the other three graduated like a couple of months after. Uh, but I still have their picture, because I think I'm showing some of his results, and his results. Uh, this is a newer picture. I have uh, four new members, right, that they don't look like them, but you can, I mean, just, they left. I have four new that are there, but are not in the picture. So, um, so what we do in my group, Let's see. Um, okay, let's. I, the videos are going to start popping up and uh, running, so let's try to be focused maybe here for a while. Uh, so, we have a lot of uh, research, right, uh, on dislocation dynamics. Uh, so, I work a lot with Avi and Irene. Uh, this is one of our, uh, it's, it's one of the simulations in our paper. And we use phase field models. This is a nanocrystal in nickel. And the blue dots are grain boundaries, and the yellow regions are stacking faults, right? So what we do is we include the stacking fault energy to, to simulate not perfect dislocations, but partial dislocations. Uh, here is the evolution of these partial dislocations under shear stress in this polycrystalline uh, nickel. Lately, this is uh, kind of a work that we did many years, I mean, some years ago. And now what we are focusing more on is on uh, alloys and high entropy alloys. I don't have a picture here, but uh, this is a super alloy. Uh, it's nickel based, and then you have some particles, right? So it can be magnesium, cobalt, so there are, depends. I don't know which one in particular is this. So what you do now is you have this dislocation, right, that you see here, the, you see the two lines, which is the leading and the trailing partial, and it's interacting with two precipitates. And these two precipitates have a different stacking fault energy than the nickel, right? And that's why you see that the, the dislocations uh, appear, right? And then they get stuck in the precipitate. In some cases, they will seep through the precipitate and, and leave a stacking fault behind. Uh, we also have simulations in which we use different variants, as you see here, right? So these are different orientations of these variants. Uh, stick, sticking with metals, right, so we also have a lot of uh, simulations and interest in recrystallization. And recrystallization is important, especially in, in tin, because these whiskers that you see here, that they grow out of the surface of a thin film of tin, happen because of recrystallization, right? So you have a, a polycrystal, you introduce some change in temperature, the grains, you have stresses in the grains, and in the grain boundaries you have rotations, you have form, form these shallow grains, and these shallow grains, they, to relax the stress, start growing, and they look like this. These are a couple of microns. It's not that they are, I mean, they are, in this case, not visible, but you can, there are some examples in which they are visible. And so this is one simulation here using finite elements in which, in which the re red regions are or crystal orientations that form the new grains. Also, now we are working a lot on, uh, so this is done with finite elements. This is phase field dislocations. Um, now we have a lot of uh, interest on semiconductor, semiconductors, like most people, right, with the CHIPS Act and all that. So we have a lot of uh, um, interest on that. And what we are doing now is uh, phase field simulations using Kim Kim Suzuki model, right? So you have a phase field, uh, Alan Kahn equations and Kahn Hillier equations, you solve them, solve them simultaneously to look at the formation of intermetallic compounds. So this is, is a solder, it's thin, the middle is thin, you have copper and copper here, and then you apply a current. And then, even before you apply a current, if it is a high, uh, not too high, but uh, 
more than room temperature, what happens is that the copper and tin form uh, an intermetallic, right? In, in particular, they form two kinds of intermetallics. The, there is one that is almost not visible, it's very thin, but the other one is copper 6, tin 5, and that is very brittle. And then the sol solder breaks because you have this intermetallic that is very brittle. Um, tin, as you know, is very anisotropic. So if uh, this is an image of the solder that shows the same solder that shows the different orientations. So uh, this is the, set, the unit cell for tin. So if you are oriented in, in this direction, this is a slow diffusion grain, and this is a very high diffusion grain. And then you, you will see that the IMC is not planar, right? So you have all this, and then if on top you have grain boundaries, you see the IMC forming there. On top of that, when you apply a current, right, the copper gets consumed because you have more uh, driving force to move the copper through the tin, right, to form the IMC, and then you run out of copper. So not only you have these problems that the, the IMC, the intermetallic compound, is very brittle, but then you start having holes there, and then you have an open circuit, and the solder fail, right, and the, the package fail. So to do that, right, so we run these are final element simulations. So we solve for the current, and we solve for the two equations, right, uh, using Kim Kim Suzuki uh, model to see the formation of IMC. So the direction of the current is this direction. Here you have copper, this is tin, and we start with two seats. And in this case, we have a grain boundary that is going to be somewhere here. You will see it in a minute. And then we solve these two equations plus the electric problem. And the IMCs start growing, and they start going through the grain boundary. And then see, here you see how the copper, copper gets consumed. And if we keep running this longer, right, so the copper will disappear from here and you have accumulation of IMCs here. Um, so then other things that we do are also like this, phase transformations. So this is uh, amorphization in a molecular crystal. This is, I think it's acetaminophen, Tylenol. Um, again, you... Uh, it's not acetaminophen because acetaminophen, I don't remember, it's some drug, okay? Um, or sugar, so because those are the kind, but what happens here is uh, you deform it, right? And because uh, these locations have very long Burgers vectors in molecular crystals, the material doesn't like these locations. So prefers to become amorphous than having high densities of these locations. Um, this is another problem, right? This is sintering. Here, again, this was done with uh, phase field dislocation dynamics. And all these are all going to be finite elements now. And this is sintering. This is a material um, that is used for infrared windows, right? So you, want, you start with these ceramics. You put them at high temperature all together, right? And you want to densify that because if you start having holes and poros inside, they are not transparent, and they want this uh, to be transparent. These are zinc sulfide particles. Um, so that's another simulation here. And here, the thing is, what we are doing is we are solving uh, phase fields using finite elements. Okay. So here again, we have this. Kim Kim Suzuki problem, right? So you, we have grains and grain boundaries. We have a conservation of the zinc sulfide, right? So we have to solve the two equations, and then we have the, the second equation will be this motion of the grain boundaries. Composite materials, right? Again, here we have fracture. We are using the same finite element, and we model fracture using a phase field approach for fracture. Um, and then also we have impact problems, right? So this, are, this is an aluminum sphere impacting an aluminum plate at two kilometers per second. And what we see here is uh, the rotation of the crystal lattice, right? So I'm plotting just that. Um, what I'm going to focus today is mostly on this, right? So these are some of the applications, right? And I, I, I'm trying to show some of the applications because usually when I go to conferences or workshops where there are a lot of mathematicians, 
you sell your product, right? And then they come to you and say, oh, you can sell this and sell that, right? And that's the goal. <laughs> so to see if you get interested on, on any of these problems and you can help me with the partial differential equations. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm going to focus on this, which are these energetic materials. Uh, I'm going to have a slide on these energetic materials coming now so I, I, you know what they are. So energetic materials are molecular crystals, right? Uh, which are, are, we have been seeing a lot of uh, dislocations and FCC, BCC, and so on. But this is how they look, right? These are, uh, they are crystals, but instead of having an atom on each point, imagine you have a molecule now, okay? And that's why the Burgers vectors are like 10 times bigger than your aluminum or copper. Um, they still have crystalline form, so this is Tylenol, this is sugar, this is gamma endometocin, which is a drug for food powder, <laughs> okay? And this is HMX, which is this explosive, right? So they, they, you see that instead of having an atom on each one in the crystal cell, you have molecules. They still have Burgers vectors, right, and slip planes. They are very hard to identify, and they are, can be identified using some energetics of the, of the crystal, but, uh, and they are very few compared to a metal. And you can guess because the symmetry is very low, right? Uh, and the other thing is that these slip planes are not planes. The molecules kind of like, they have to jump like this, right? Because, or, or they rotate. So it's very hard to try to do any kind of dislocation dynamics on these materials. So then we went to continuum crystalline plasticity. Uh, so here is an example. This is what you see here is a dislocation, but instead of your usual dislocation in which you have only the atoms, you have all these molecules, right? And this is how it looks, a dislocation in HMX, okay? So these materials have plasticity, very limited plasticity, and they, have, they are very real, as I say. And even when you fabricate them, you put all these particles here, which are the molecular crystals, and they are attached to each other with a polymer, right? So 95% are the HMX particles, and the 5% is just the polymer. The polymer is just to keep them together, basically. They are very real, and here we have an experiment that we ran, uh, yeah, this is Chen's group, uh, Wen Chen's group at Purdue, and this is an X-ray experiment. They have the material with a very few particles, see, but it's the same, that same material, but with lower density of particles to be able to see them better. And when you impact this at 100 meters per second, you see how they crash, and you see a lot of fracture, okay? If uh, most of the impact simulations that are done in this kind of materials in HMX, right, for example, or in any explosive are higher velocities. 100 meters per second is on the low side. Most of the experiments that they con conduct are at two kilometers per second or more, right? So one to four kilometers per second. And it's not very, the importance of these materials is, what happens is that if you impact them with a high velocity, then you have defects inside this material, small cracks, voids, particle, polymer interfaces, and they become very hot. And when they become very hot, they start a chemical reaction. And if the chemical reaction is sustained, right, then you start a shock. I mean, you have the shock wave, you start a detonation wave, and when the shock and the detonation, the detonation wave accelerates itself, and then you have a detonation, right? So what is very important in these materials is try to understand the temperature, that's the outcome that we care, right? So you impact this and you want to know, you are going to create these hotspots, but you want to know the size and the temperature of these hotspots. Because, uh, for example, using this Tarver criteria tells you that this is the critical temperature of the hotspot as a function of the size. If you have a very small hotspot, you need very high temperature, so it's going to have uh, you are going to have a detonation. So if you are above this line, you have a detonation. If you are below, you are not. Because if your hotspot is small and 
not too hot, it's going to dissipate the temperature and nothing is going to happen, right? So you want big hotspots or small that are very hot. And there is a lot of discussion in the community, and still there is, is what causes these hotspots? Is plasticity, is fracture, is friction, is uh, void collapsing, and you read each paper, and they are going to tell you, at least, I mean, that's what we also do. <laughs> uh, so if you have a fracture model, you're going to say, yeah, it's fracture. If you have a plasticity model, you're going to say, yeah, it's plasticity. If you are doing just a void collapse, it's a collapse, right? Because you don't have any other thing. And we tend to do that, right? So you have your model and you want to use it, right? And you want to convince everyone else that this is the, the mechanism. Uh, so here they, they have several mechanisms that are proposed, uh, shear banding, uh, cracks, friction. This uh, represents this uh, void collapse and recompression. And, um, this is one uh, simulation, an MD simulation of void collapse. So if you go to the molecular dynamics community, they are going to tell you is the impact of this surface of the void on the other side, and also plasticity, because they don't do fracture, right? They don't have any fracture there. So they, uh, this is 80 nanometers, so and there, there is no way that a crack is going to nucleate and start at these scales. So what we are trying to do in this project was try to put fracture, plasticity, collapse of voids, and then run simulations under different conditions and see which one of the mechanisms uh, are the most important. One of the problems that we have is that when you go to identify the mechanisms, these voids, for example, uh, in this simulation they are very small because we were trying to compare to MD. But uh, you can go from a few hundreds of nanometers to maybe two, five, ten microns. But then the problem is that the detonation, right, if you want to simulate the whole detonation, it happens in five millimeters. So there is no way that you can actually resolve the voids, right, and do the full scale simulation with particles, polymer, right, so you have to start coming up with surrogate models. And these surrogate models, right, then they are included in these detonation uh, simulations, shock simulations, and then you may or may not have this, um, this detonation. So I'm going to go over all these examples later. I want to show you just this one. So this is at four, uh, as I said, at 100 meters per second. That's, I'm not sure, but I, I think that's the range. But it's below 100 meters per second, so for sure. This was done at 400 meters per second. Uh, you have a particle, and then you see that it just crashes, and then uh, the camera didn't work anymore. So it's, uh, you have a lot of temperature, right? And then uh, you see the, the particle is here. You see these two parallel lines are the particle, and the rest is a polymer. And it's very hard to tell from the experiment, right? So if you have plasticity, I mean, fracture, for sure, you have fracture. Um, OK. So what we have been using is this code that is called Moose, uh, who is out of Idaho National Lab. But the last time I checked their website, now they also mention Los Alamos, and they mention other labs. So I think maybe they're starting to have a, a, some collaborations with other labs. Um, but it was out of, of there, and it's a very nice code because it's finite elements, but it's a code that is finite elements prepared to do multiphysics using phase fields, okay, which is what we were looking for. Um, uh, so what we added in the code, some things were there, we have to modify for our material. Um, it was fracture mechanics, fracture was already there, we have to change the model, right? Because it was there for metal, so we have to change it to this HMX. Um, we added interfacial friction to have temperature. Uh, we added an anisotropic fracture. Plasticity was there, but it was for, again, metals, so we have to put our uh, slip, uh, slip planes for HMX. And then uh, we solve also thermal, thermal transport to get the hotspots. Uh, another thing that you need to change is this thing that is called equation of state, which is materials at these impact velocities don't behave like hooks, a hooks material anymore, so we cannot use the typical stress strain behavior. 
So uh, as you compress them, they are nonlinear because you do it very fast and they, you do it at very high uh, pressures. So it's not linear. So you have to include an equation of state that relates temperature, not temperature, uh, pressure and volume. Okay. The shear part, we still use a uh, typical crystal plasticity, but for the pressure, we have another equation. And then chemical reactions to, to see the detonation. Um, so the fracture model is the first part that we started. And we, as I say, we use phase field models, right? Uh, the advantage of phase field models is that you don't have to use cohesive elements or anything like that. And you have a field that tracks where the material is damaged or where not, the, or, or not, right? So in our case, if you have this picture here, right? So this is the typical cohesive element, I would say, representation of a crack. And if you represent this with a phase field, it looks like this. It's not uh, in 2D, it's not a line anymore, it's, it's a surface, right? It's all this. Uh, so when this, uh, co this material, this phase field actually is one, we say it's damaged, and when it is zero, it's undamaged, or the other way, it depends how you define it, right? And so you, this term here represents the Griffith energy, right? So basically, with this term, you represent the, the energy that you need to open a crack, and this term here penalizes the thickness of the crack in the phase field model. We use Griffith criteria because it's a brittle material, right? As you can see here from the experiment. So here you have an, um, this, is a, this material, right? But with larger dimensions and the impact is with a ball and you see all the cracks going radially, which gives an indication that it's a brittle material. Uh, we did some simulations with PMMA, right? To, see that we were doing the, the things correctly, right? And we see bifurcation. And in this case, so these are at different uh, opening velocities. So we see bifurcation. This crack, for example, it starts bifurcating, but then doesn't have enough energy. And it, ha it goes again into one crack. And it has to do with this Riley criteria, right? So if you reach this velocity, you cannot go above this velocity, so the crack needs to open. And then the velocity goes down. And in this case, you are in this regime, which is this one, right, where the velocity is going up and down because it's opens and closed, opens and closed. Uh, so now we go, we, we have this fracture model, and we go and we compare this with some experiments. Again, here you have this experiment, which is one particle here, and we compress it at 10 meters per second. So this is slower. And you see how the cracks appear and start propagating inside the particle. Um, then we have other one. So this is what we call poor quality surface because this particle is both in bulk, right? And has very, what they consider very poor quality. This one is a higher quality particle, same material, but uh, they, they say that the su surface lo looks much better in this particle. And it has to do with this one, that not having any cracks interfacing the, uh, the surface of the particle. And this one doesn't break, right? So this one breaks, this one doesn't. So we run simulations using the same particle. And what we did is we put, OK, we consider this one to be poor particle. And we put a few cracks initially right in the surface. Then we compress it, and we see how the cracks advance. And here, we have initial cracks, but they are all inside the particle, no, no crack in the interface. And under the same conditions, in this case, the cracks do not grow, and the particle doesn't break. And this is done, so the particle is HMX, and the polymer is HTPB, and this one is Silgar, and the same particle HMX, and we see, in this case, it breaks even faster than before. And we have more cracks, and also the lamination. And in this case, it's again, the quality of the particle is what changes. And when we deform it up to there, now in, under this, uh, with this um, metrics, now we have cracks. And this is basically what they see the, in the experiment, right? If they change the uh, metrics, you can have or not have cracks. And also when you change the quality of the surface of the particle. That's yeah. That's oh. uh, is there a reason for why the face field wants the crack? tips move horizontally 
why the phase field moves vertically? Yeah, so the reason is that the fracture, uh, these materials, we are not sure, but we assume that these materials break in tension. Okay, so when you compress it, it has the forms in this direction and the cracks propagate in this direction. Yeah, but why is the uh, crack kind of advancing and eating up into the banks, the surfaces of the crack? It looks like it goes vertically as well. Mm, I, I'm not sure what you are. So in which one? This one? Yeah. You have a shock coming in and back, and the, the cracks, what is the same thing that they see in the, in, the, in the experiments, the cracks just propagate like this, horizontally. And in the experiment, the thing is they crash it that much that then rotates, right? But you see, after a while, it also see it moves also, into the vertical direction. It ah, eats up the material. Right? Yeah, it has to do with some initial random cracks that we put, right, inside the particle. It's not the phase field itself that, because I know phase field has this issue for dynamic problems. It kind of continues to eat up to basically get damage into the surfaces of the crack. But that's okay. Okay, I, yeah, I don't know. So, but. Um, uh, so then what we have, we are interested in temperature, right? So the way we included the temperature now is uh, in, the, in this simplified geometry, right? You have a crack here and then we apply shear, right? And compression. And we say that the temperature, the source of temperature for a crack is just friction. So it's this term that you have here. And this term tells you, you have a friction coefficient, then you have the um, traction, normal traction to the crack and then the relative velocities between the two surfaces. And you can get all this out of the phase field, right? So the uh, traction, I mean, from the final element simulations and the relative velocity you can get from um, information from the phase field. So we uh, included that. So this is, again, the same problem in which you have two surfaces and also a gradient of temperature that we put and it's solving. The mechanical problem, sharing this, and at the same time, solving for the temperature, and you see the increase in temperature in the, uh, in the region where you have a crack, right, due to friction. And these are some comparisons for times and analytical solutions just to have some peace of mind and, and making sure that the implementation was right. Um, so then we try to mimic this problem. Right? This problem, as I say, is a polymer, a particle, and polymer, and the impact from this side. And we, what we did is just half of the particle. And then what we do in these particles, we put very few initial cracks or more, and different lengths and different distributions. And what we see is that when we impact, right, uh, the maximum temperature and most of the damage happens on the face that is where the uh, shock impacts, okay? Uh, so this is the phase field, right? So we are plotting just the phase field here so we can see the cracks, how they start and they propagate. We see a lot of uh, cracks propagating in this interface and that generates higher temperatures, as I say, always in the phase that is where the shock is incoming. Um, and then uh, after we did these simulations, we were very happy because then this group uh, in um, University of Illinois, they not lot uh, group, found that doing the experiments when they shock these HMX particles inside a polymer, they see that the hot interface is where the shock is coming, right? And they can do very fast measurements of temperature, which is very, I didn't know, but it's very hard to measure. So there are very, very few experiments that can really look and resolve temperature fields in, in very short, these are nanoseconds, okay, in, in very short periods of time. Um, after that, we did shocks in polycrystals, so now we have these particles of HMX inside a polymer, and we look at distributions, right? So you, you, we do it at different velocities. We also look at different distributions of initial cracks in the particles, right? In this case, it's the same distribution, but just different velocities, and we see that the temperature, clearly, it gets hotter, right? So, uh, we have more temperature when the initial, um, when the impact velocity is higher. And then here we compare this with the starboard plots, and we say if you impact at 50 meters per second, you're not going to have a detonation because all your 
distributions of temperature as a function of size of these hotspots are below the Tarver plot. And in this case, we see some cases in which you may have a, a detonation, right? Because you have some hotspots that are at very high temperature, right? And all this, uh, all we are putting here is just a friction due to the cracks opening and uh, sliding, I mean, they, they, they slide the different surfaces slide respect to each other. Um, then we went and we added plasticity. Uh, so we have this model. I mean, it's the typical Azaros model right from the 80s, I think. It's rate dependent and it's a, visco, it's a viscoplastic model. Uh, and it's the same equations I think the uh, Jaime showed before. And then we have hardening um, and yeah, hardening and cross slip, right? And I didn't, oh, the reference is not there, but this is, we didn't, uh, we, they use a different plasticity model, but the model was already uh, calibrated with experiments uh, from the work of Austin in, in national, in Lawrence Livermore National Lab. For some reason, the reference got erased, but they already identify all the slip systems that you have here, right? The Vargas vectors, and those are the, uh, the hardening coefficients that go here. So this is how the single crystal, I mean, the, not the single crystal, but a, a, a cell, right? A unit cell, several unit cells actually of HMX look like. This is another view. And as you can say, right, so it's, uh, it's orthorhombic. So here, these are the angles between the, um, the lice vectors. So this is the A, C, and B south of plane. And these are just some simulations to check a single crystal. And here we have stress and then the sleep activities in all the sleep systems that are A10. Um, and as I mentioned, right, so here are the lattice parameters. And you can see, right, they are very long compared to what we are used to in metals. And you have the angles here also, right? So it's 102 degrees and not 90, like we are used in metals. Um, so we use their, we in, I mean, we implemented our plasticity model using their calibration. Uh, here is the reference, Barton and Austin. Um, then the problem is that it's very hard, as I say, to calibrate the temperature because they cannot measure the temperature in real time, right, in experiments. And so what we did is we compare our simulations to MD simulations, and that was our, our calibration because that's, they have information on temperature, plasticity, and pressure, right? And so we did these plots. The MDs are the symbols, and our simulations are the circles in red with, um, with the line just to help you guide your, eye, your eyes. Uh, so this is typically what you look at, which is the shock um, velocity as a function of the impact velocity that follows this equation, right, that you have here. Uh, this is an output of the code, right? Um, something that I didn't measure, I mentioned, but maybe I'm mentioning later, oh, no, it's here, is that we use this uh, equation of a state, sorry about the size, but this equation of state gives you the pressure as a function of the relative uh, deformation, V0 over the volume, right? And as a, so if you have a Hooke's law, this will be linear, and these materials, when you impact them at these high uh, pressures, it's not linear anymore. And they, there are several of these equations of state that relate the pressure and the volume. And then here, what, to get the temperature as a function of the impact velocity, what we did was to calibrate these parameters that tell you how much of the plastic dissipation gets converted into a heat. And the other term, the first one, actually this one, has to do with something that we call artificial viscosity. So when you have these shocks, you need to add some viscosity to get rid of oscillations, right? And that also induces some temperature. There is discussion if this is physical or not, but we have, we have that term, so we have to calibrate this coefficient and tell how much of that dissipation goes into temperature, and then how much of the plasticity goes also into temperature. Okay. Um, so then, pressing the wrong 
think I pressed something wrong and now I have to come here. Um, so these are comparison one-to-one, -one, finite element simulations and MD simulations for an 80 nanometer void. Uh, the impact velocity here, uh, I believe, is one kilometer per second. And so this is what they see in the MD simulations. And what you see is a lot of shear bands, uh, plasticity, right, plastic activity. And then when you deforms a lot, you see that the plastic activity happens not in the slip planes, but in shear bands. In, in that they are oriented at certain uh, de degrees. In our simulations, we don't see the shear bands because we don't include that. Uh, but the temperatures, right, uh, the velocity, for example, with the, the calibration, we try, this is the calibration process. We compare one to one uh, our simulations with them. And this is the temperature field. And again, you see a lot of shear bands. We don't have the same shear bands, but we try to mimic the same temperatures. So this high temperature here is an effect that has to do with the, the way we load it. So we don't take that, in, don't take that into account, right? Yeah. Don't in this case, no. Yeah. We are putting things one by one. Yeah, we will get there at some point, hopefully. Yeah. But in this one, we still don't have thermal softening. Um, exactly. Yeah. 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 But we didn't have time yet to put it there. But it's going to be there. Um, but that, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, so then. Uh, and we didn't, the other answer to that question is that we didn't worry that much about the shear bands because they are at nanometer scale. And uh, at nanometer scale, MD does much better than us, right? So we don't care much at resolving these shear bands at nanometer scale. But we care more about then comparing with experiments in which this experiment, this is 500 microns. We are not going to be able to resolve the shear bands, right? So that's, that's another reason why. Uh, we didn't put them. It, wasn't, it was not a priority, let's put it that way. Um, so this is an experiment. Here now they are impacting at 100 meter per second. This is the crystal HMX. And here you see the evolution of the, um, it has a cylindrical hole, right? They machine the cylindrical hole and they compress it and you see how it gets uh, compressed. There is a lot of uh, kind of other lines that you see there, right, that last doesn't look like it's decreasing, but it has to do with the alineation. The, the cylinder is not perfectly aligned with the X-rays. So you see some shades because it's kind of like twisted. So we run our simulations now with 500, meters, 500 microns. So we went from 80 to 500. And these are the same simulation that here at 100 meters per second with different crystal orientations for the HMX, then 500 meters per second, one kilometer and two kilometers per second. And what we are showing here are the magnitude of the, the velocities. It's very hard to compare, right, because it's all kind of quantitative. So, but then what we did is uh, we compared with experiments the area of the void as a function of time, right? And the blue are the experiments and these are our simulations. Uh, the yellow ones are at 100 meters per second that they agree. And then we start having boundary condition problem, right? So we start having that the shock is going, but then it starts going, coming back and so on that in the experiment they don't see. So we couldn't compare all the way to here until they collapse it. And then this, we don't have comparison because they didn't do experiments at these velocities, but that will be how the area, right? Relative area or the area divided by the initial area evolves with time. Um, here we have comparisons of the same, um, the, the rate actually, which is this constant that you have here, right? So it's linear with time. So then we compare, compare this constant for different velocities and different size of the voids, uh, finite element simulations, MD simulations and the one experiment that we have, and you can see the, the trend makes sense, right? So we have very similar trends. Values do not agree, or we, we really don't know uh, how much they have to agree, if it has to be dependent on the void size or not, right? Um, just to get something more uh, quantita uh, yeah, quantitative. And here also we look into, for example, um, 
phone on drug limit, right? So this is a very high strain rates. So we look at the effect of the phone on drug and how the phone on drug will affect the deformation and also the temperature distribution. Unfortunately, we don't have anything to compare with, right? Because we don't have experiments with these length scales and uh, with temperature measurement. But there are so many parameters, right, that you have into this model. It's not just the sleep systems, the rate, uh, a lot. Uh, there are many, many other parameters, and we uh, compare, we play around a little bit with them to understand what's going on. So now that we have plasticity and fracture, huh, uh, we look at these experiments. These are from Saug, uh, I think it's in Los Alamos, right? No, you don't know? Okay. Uh, but he's in one of the national labs. I have, I, sorry, I don't remember. But these are very nice experiments because they grab one HMX single crystal and they impact the single crystal in the 110 direction, right? The 110 is out of the screen. And then they orient it in a different direction and you see the impact at the same velocity and you see the difference. In this case, you see a lot of cracks going in this direction. In these ones, they get a lot of uh, damage, right? And the material becomes a uh, burn. So then we did our simulations. Uh, they already run, the videos already went by. So let me go back again. Uh, so the first simulation we did is isotropic fracture. It's in three dimensions and includes fracture and plasticity. And then we put the orientation of the, um, um, I mean, we included the orientation in the fracture, right? And uh, the, the orientation dependence in the fracture model, the, um, the planes that are weaker, the word, I cannot find the word now. Um, but there are certain planes that are weaker, right? And you know that cracks for, huh? Cleavage plane, yes, thank you, <laughs> that's the word. And so we included that in the simulations and we see that when it is oriented in the 110 direction, we have these cracks and they are oriented in the same direction that here. But when you orient it in the 010 direction, we see a hole going through the whole sample. And this has to do with interaction between plasticity. So in this case, you have more plasticity, so your crack is smaller. In the other case, you have less plasticity, so your crack is bigger, right? So it's um, ca kind of this discussion. is plasticity or is fracture is both, and one affects the other one, okay? So uh, then with this, we went to model what they call a class 3 polycrystal HMX, in which you have, it's like a pellet that you compress all together. The thing we like about this is that there is no polymer, just the HMX. Uh, is, the polymer is not very nice when you have very little, right? So your, the elements get deformed and they, it's very hard to deal with that. So we compare with that and uh, they, it's called class three because the grain size are around 100 microns or more. And what they see in their, in their uh, experiments is that all the regions, right, that are uh, where you have these cracks, in principle, those are the ones that they get hot, right? So we came up with our simulation, uh, with our grain structure, and we have this simulation of a shock advancing in this crystal. And because every single grain is oriented in a different direction, they reach different temperatures just because they have different plastic deformation, right? So depending on the orientation of the, um, of the grains, you are going to have more or less plastic deformation, which generates more or less heat. And then, uh, so these are uh, some, um, this is what we call random, I mean, they are different orientations for the, the grains here. And we impact at one kilometer, 400 meters, and 100 meters per second. And you see different colors, but we don't see a lot of temperature, right? So the temperature goes a little bit. In this case, just 10 degrees up, 50. In this one, a lot more, 175 degrees up, right, from compared to room uh, temperature. And then if you run the same simulation with a single crystal oriented in, um, in this grain, so we choose this grain, and then we oriented a single crystal in the same direction that this grain was. And now, obviously, we have the temp temperature everywhere. But then if you compare it, right, 
you are missing all these peaks in temperature, this extreme, they are not that extreme, but these peaks in temperature that may cause these hotspots. Hot so when you simulate this, you don't care much about the average temperature. You care about these uh, regions that are small or not, right? And they have very high temperature. So the, always you need to look at these kind of plots, the temperature and the size of the hotspot. And what we see that if you do a single crystal simulation, your average temperature, right, is here. So this is what you get. But when you start putting random orientations in the, in the grains, you see all these that are smaller, right, but they are at very high temperature. So then to understand the discussion of fracture or not importance of fracture, we took the same microstructure. And now we did, uh, we included a, a fracture, and we include a fracture, and then the cracks initiate in the grain boundaries, and we have now hot spots that are very hot, right? High, higher temperatures than before, so we reach 500 degrees now, impacting at 400 meters per second. And it's all happening in the grain boundaries, and it has to do with the friction of the grains with respect to each other. Uh, so if we have only plasticity, right, for the 400 meters per second, we were here at 350. And as you can see here, we are 100 degrees more. And this is just everything that is inside the grain, and these hotspots are all in the grain boundaries. Um, so this, I guess, solves the, the discussion, right? Is fracture or is plasticity what is more important? In this range of velocities, we think it's fracture and friction. At higher impact velocities, is not fracture or plasticity, is this void collapse. So these are MD simulations, and they, they were done by a uh, Strachan group. At, uh, um, I was going to say in Los Alamos, but not for you. Um, <clears throat> and so what you see here is a horizontal crack. This is HMX, and they impact at two kilometers per second. And you see the high temperature in the, in the void. These are all the simulations for different orientations of cracks, right? And it's very interesting because they get different ranges of temperatures and different size of the hotspots depending on the crack orientation. Um, so then we say this is what they get, right? This distribution of temperature as a function of the area. Instead of this, we were saying before size of the hotspot, uh, this is the area which is the size square only, but they get up to 7,000 degrees, right? So we went and we ran our simulations and compared to their data, and here are our simulations. So we get 1,000 degrees, right? Not even close to all that. And the problem is that we don't include the recompression, right? Which is all this ejecta that you see. It's very clear, I guess, in these videos this ejecta that is flying from one surface to the other, and it's not something that we can uh, resolve using finite element continuum simulations. So we use this model, right, um, that was developed, I think Tim is here, so if you have questions, you can ask him. Uh, so this model that tells you what's the temperature of the crack, that you're, what's the temperature that you're going to get depending on the gap, right? They came up with this very nice model that scales the temperature, the jumping temperature with the crack opening. So we included this in our simulations. Um, and now we are in the same range of temperatures, right? That they, the MD and F, uh, final elements are in the same range of temperatures. Uh, and this is kind of the surrogate model, right? So this part, we don't solve it because we cannot solve particles flying, but that's the, the surrogate model. Um, so I, I was told I have only two minutes, so I'm going to skip this, uh, because this is the detonation and the chemistry that I'm sure you don't, are not that interested. But I think the take home message is, until you don't put everything in your model, it's very hard to tell, right? Uh, and it's very hard to say it's going to be plasticity, it's going to be fracture, or this or that, right? Uh, because not only uh, one is more important than the other, but also because they are a couple, right? And if you have more fracture, your plasticity goes down, right? Because the material relaxes because of cracks. Your stress goes down, you have less plasticity, and the other way. Um, so those are the collaborators, and those are some 
former students that are, as, as I said, they are gone. These are still in the group, so all the work was done by them. <laughs>